So here we go. Okay, I think we are recording. So words of the wise, uh, we are recording this. Uh, Dick Carter, you all know and love him as our local poet. Uh, he, but he grew up in Southern Oregon, Medford, Ashel, Ashford, Eagle Point. Easy for me to say area. Um, <laughs> you can correct me anytime you want. Uh, he has Ash degrees Land. from Ashland. <laughs> oh, Ashland. Sorry. Uh, he has degrees from three different universities: a BA at the University of Oregon, an MA at Indiana U, and an MA at UW, a uh, little local school. In San Francisco, he was in advertising and PR, uh, and then he taught in Oregon for four years, Seattle for 27 years. He was a high school teacher of Russian and Spanish. He's been married to his wonderful, wonderful wife, Jane, who is amazing in PowerPoint. You'll see her images all over the place. This is her PowerPoint. She did such a good job with it. I told her I'd embarrass her, so there I am embarrassing her. Um, and they've lived in the Hearthstone for five years. They do lots of great programs for us. And this one is no exception. So thank you in advance, Dick, and I will allow you to take it away um, after I share the screen. Hold on just a moment. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, before I get started, there's, there's a question that was often asked me at the end of my presentation. And that was uh, why I got interested in studying Russian and uh, so I'll kind of use that as an introduction. I, it was in the 1950s and I was living in San Francisco and it was the height of the Cold War. And I was feeling especially uh, helpless. Uh, it seemed like the uh, big wheels in the Kremlin and in Washington DC were getting us into a, a fighting war and, uh, all us little people would have to go out and fight it. So I thought, well, uh, Canada and America, uh, the United States have been at peace for all these many years. And one thing that helped that peace is that we have a mutual language. So I thought, well, if more Americans learned Russian and more Russians learned America, well, maybe uh, there'd be less of a chance of uh, us going out and shooting each other. Uh, I, I was thinking at the time just to learn the Russian for don't shoot would be a good start. Uh, I recently uh, had a book published called Russian Passages and it includes uh, the pictures that you're going to see in this presentation. And in this presentation, I also show about 10 or 15 more pictures than what are in the book. It covers my travels from, uh, in Russia from 1966 to 2010. And it doesn't completely cover them, but uh, it's the highlights. Now, I'd like to show you a map of Russia so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, there we go. Uh, this up here is St. Petersburg. And <clears throat> when I first started traveling to Russia, that was called Leningrad. But after the uh, overthrow of communism in 1991, well, it reverted to its original name given to it by the founder, Peter the Great, St. Petersburg. And he wasn't thinking of naming it after himself. He was thinking of naming it after his patron saint. Then uh, down here is Moscow. And this was a, uh, or is a, an overnight train ride. The train goes a little slow in places to time it so people get a good night's sleep on the train. Uh, I've also traveled to uh, the coast of the Black Sea and up into the Caucasus. You'll see some pictures of that. And over to Baku on the Caspian Sea, that's down here. And then uh, our major trip that Jane and I took was all the way from Moscow, clear uh, 
on the Trans-Siberian Railway, hitting major cities like uh, Ekaterinburg, Novosibirsk, and Irkutsk, and uh, Lake Baikal, and Ulan Ude, and then a long haul up over the, they call it over the hump, and down to Vladivostok. And from there, we flew home via Korea. And it made it kind of a round the world trip of it. Uh, in 1966, I was uh, teaching Russian at a junior high school in Medford, Oregon, but I was offered the opportunity to attend Indiana University on a uh, uh, government scholarship uh, that was offered to teachers of, of Russian. And of course, I I leaped at the chance. We'll change slides. The slides are not advancing. I think the slides. There, there we go. And uh, so, with a group from from. Uh, Indiana University as part of our education there. We uh, went to Russia for six weeks. It was a tour where we, we promised not to speak any English. And uh, the, the way the work, it worked is in the mornings, we would uh, go on the traditional tour of the city and, and see the uh, the most famous tourist sites of that city. And in the afternoon, we were free to go out and uh, visit with uh, Russians and uh, practice our language skills. Uh, anyway, this is myself on the left and uh, my friend, George Fletcher on the right, and a, a young lady, Russian, in the middle. And one thing we learned that uh, they wanted was when we wanted to talk to them, and when they learned we were Americans, they wanted to talk to us, is that you couldn't do it inside any building where there might be microphones or eavesdroppers. You had to go outside into a park, or like you see here outside this building, where you could see that uh, there was no microphones and no one was listening. Uh, we spent a, a generally a week in uh, six major places as we traveled. The first one was what was then called Leningrad. And then from there, we went down to the Caucasus show you a picture here in just a minute. We're, we're having difficulty with advancing the slides. There. There. Um, and in the Caucasus, <clears throat> which is that strip of mountain, mountainous land between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, we stayed at what is called a sports camp. And in the mornings, we would uh, go on hikes through the mountains. And I, I must say that the forests there are very much like the, the Cascades. Felt right at home. And then in the afternoons, we had time to, uh, to rest and visit with uh, all the Russians, people that were there. Very nice stay. In, in this area, uh, I, I had to climb up a uh, hillside in order to get this picture. There were little monuments here and there saying things like three Soviet soldiers buried here. And we go a little further and you'd see six Soviet soldiers buried here. And it shows that was some of the fighting that went on in that area during World War II. And I've often wondered 
uh, well, what happened to the dead German soldiers? How come there was no monuments? Well, I'm still wondering. Uh, something else interesting about that part of the country, <clears throat> for some of you people that are interested in indoor plants, there was a plant that we call hen and chickens, and it uh, is there called wolf cabbage, and it grows wild in that part of the country. We pay anywhere from three to seven dollars a pot for it here, and there it's growing all over the place. It's very interesting. There we go. One of the hikes we took was uh, up to a glacier. It, this was about uh, oh, five miles from where we left the bus. It was interesting that uh, in America, when you have to walk five miles back into the woods, you don't see many people, just a few hardy hikers. But uh, there, I remember this one lake we went past, and, and uh, the shores of the small lake were packed with Russian hikers. It was nice to see so many people enjoying the great outdoors. We came to this glacier, and it was quite a change from walking on a glacier in America. In America, you have all kinds of equipment like crampons and ice axes and ropes and sometimes ladders and things but but uh, there there was no thought of all that stuff it was just uh, we wore our tennis shoes and we jumped across the crevasses uh, it was an interesting hike it, uh, one thing that I was most impressed with was looking down into a crevasse and seeing the aquamarine color of the ice some of you that have walked up, climbed up one of the mountains here, like Mount Rainier, know what I'm talking about. Uh, there was a 19-year uh, gap between this trip with Indiana University and my next trip. And in that time, I, uh, I got married, had children, and just life went on. And finally, I got the opportunity to, to go back. We're still trying to change the screen there. Yeah. There we go. Uh, In I'll, I'll interrupt briefly to say I'm. Uh, Dick, I'm changing the screen. So just anytime you want a new slide, just let me know. I'm right here. Okay. Okay. In uh, 1987, uh, it seems that the American government really wanted Russian speakers. So they, uh, they gave fellowships to uh, 25 American teachers of Russian to go to St. Petersburg. Uh, I think it was still Leningrad at the time, and uh, attend the Herzen Institute where we had um, language classes and lectures and uh, a very good education in, in Russia with Russian teachers and everything. But anyway, uh, my first morning there, I was hoping that uh, it was former student of mine named Rod Morrill would uh, introduce me to the man on the left here, which is Andre Yakovlev, a very famous artist in Russia, and his wife, Larissa, over on the right. But uh, and Rod was visiting Leningrad at the time that I arrived, but I got a note from him saying that he had unexpectedly had to leave a couple of days early. So I thought to myself, well, there goes my chance to meet Andre Yakovlev. Well, the first morning I was there, uh, as was my custom, I like to read the morning paper, no matter what language it's in. And I walked the one block from the Herzen Institute up to the main street of 
St. Petersburg, which is called the uh, uh, Nevsky Prospect. I bought the newspaper at a kiosk and turned around, and there stood Andre out walking his little dog, Petunia. And so I walked over to him and I introduced him myself, and he said, in effect, well, any friend of Rob Morrow's is a friend of mine. Come up to the apartment and let's have a drink. <laughs> so uh, that began, be, that uh, started the friendship that lasted for the entire six weeks that I was there. And really a lifelong friendship. So, uh, Change the slide. Slide, uh, Alan. There we go. There's Andre with his little poodle named Tunya. Uh, those of us, you that uh, know us know that we have a dog named Tunya too. Well, it seems that uh, Andre's dog died and then his wife died and since then he has died. But uh, his memory lives on, especially in our own dog named Tunya. Next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, I don't have any pictures of the faculty there at the Harrison Institute, but I thought you might enjoy seeing a couple of the students. These two girls are from what was then Yugoslavia, the town of Sarajevo. And uh, I remember them especially because they asked several of us Americans to sing our national anthem for them. So we, we uh, went out into the back stairwell, which was uh, very acoustically, at, uh, well, it was beautiful acoustics. And uh, we sang, they enjoyed it immensely. And uh, I took their pictures. So I, Uh, part of the 1987 trip, th this was an exchange that had been arranged by uh, Gorbachev and uh, Ronald Reagan, in which uh, 25 American teachers of Russian uh, were invited to study in Russia, and 25 Russian teachers of English were invited to teach in America. Well, uh, when we early in our stay there at the Harrison Institute, one of our fellow students wrote a letter to uh, Gorbachev, sent it through official communist channels, and told him that uh, the last couple of days of our, our visit to Russia, we would be in Moscow and that we would love to meet him and thank him personally for arranging the the exchange. Well, he took us up on it, except uh, liked the idea. So when we were in, Mo in Moscow at the end of the trip, well, he invited us up to the Communist Party headquarters, which was his office, and uh, walked in the room. And this is where we knew we were going to meet Gorbachev. It had been kept secret up to that point. I walked in, the flash bulbs were going off, and when I, uh, my eyes got focused, I, I uh, could tell by the birthmark on the, on his forehead that yes, I was looking at Gorbachev. So he sat us down uh, around a, a huge table, and uh, he gave a 40-minute speech, which it was broadcast all over the Soviet Union, and uh, I took notes. When he finished, well, he came around the table shaking all of our hands again. And I, I pointed to my notes and asked him if he'd sign them. And he said, certainly, and signed my notes. So I, I'm the only one American that uh, got his autograph out of that visit. So moving on. Next slide. Uh, the next series of visits to Russia brought about by school exchanges. 
it seems this this lady uh, here in the white coat is the principal of the school number 70 and her name was Mrs. Panchoshina and uh, she and uh, a lot of the teachers and students from school 70 met me and my delegation of some 15 American students from Kailan High School where I was teaching. They met us at the train station and uh, invited us to stay with uh, all, all our students had homestays. Uh, notice the, the man standing on the left here, that's, that's Andre. He was at the uh, train station to meet us. Um, we stayed half of the of our stay there with him and the other half with the, another teacher, Karina Varyanova, and we'll see more of her later. Okay, slide. Next slide. Uh, here we are having a, a planning session and tea with the Russian teachers. Nadezhda and Irina and Mrs. Panchoshina and Jane and I. And you see the typical Russian samovar there in the middle. Next slide. Uh, during our stay with with uh, Andre, he uh, painted Jane's portrait. And you see the real Jane on the left and the portrait in the middle and uh, Andre with his paintbrush with the finishing touches on it. Next slide. Uh, here we are having Part of the exchange agreement with school number 70 was uh, that we would send our teachers there for homestays and uh, visits to the school. And then in return, they would send an equal number of students to us. And so this is um, Irina who uh, was chauffeuring the, uh, she was just chaperoning the group of Russian students and she arrived at the airport and brought Jane's portrait. Uh, we would have brought it ourselves, but Andre wasn't quite happy with it, so he wanted to keep it a while and finish it. Next slide. Uh, after the school exchanges, we had three of them. Uh, we had exchanges of, of uh, church nature. Uh, the uh, parish that uh, my church, St. Saint Mark's Episcopal Cathedral, uh, partnered up with was called Church of Coolidge and Pasca. And the pastor, Father Victor, is right there in the middle. And behind him on our right, is his son, Georgi, who since his picture has taken, had, it was taken, he has become a priest himself and, and he's slowly taking over the duties that uh, his father had had. And I wanted to show you that the lady in the white coat here, that's Nadezhda Vasilita Kolesnikova. And she was our trip arranger and guide and interpreter and general helper on all these church exchanges. We owe a great debt of gratitude. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Uh, there she is now. She's, uh, we're at what they call the, uh, the summer palace and she's uh, giving a talk about the palace. See her in a typical pose. She became a good friend. Next slide. Now, Kulich and Pasca has strange architecture. Uh, the, the main part of the church is on the left here and it's cylindrical shaped. 
And it seems that at Easter time, the Russians served two dishes called Kulich and pasta. Kulich is a Russian Easter bread. And uh, it's always in a cylinder shape. And pasta is a blend of cheeses molded into a pyramid shape. And you see the, the pyramid shape building on the right behind the tree there. So the architecture of, of the church of Kulich and Pasta is, is a, a continual reminder of, to the Russians of Easter and, and the celebration of Easter. Next, Next slide. slide. There we are with, with Father, Father Victor. He, he has had an interesting life. He, he uh, survived the uh, blockade of Leningrad during World War II. And he credits his survival to the fact that he was wounded by shell fire. You know, the, the Germans kept continual bombardment, both planes and cannon of St. Petersburg. So having been injured by shell fire, he was put in the hospital and he credits his survival to that because they gave better food to the patients in the hospital, better than what the people on the outside were able to get. Next slide. Uh, the uh, most venerated icon at the church of Coolidge and Pasca is called the Icon Mother of God, Joy to All Who Sorrow. And icons, you know, are, are based on uh, biblical things. And this is uh, based on a, a passage from Matthew where they talk about feeding the hungry, visiting the prisoners, curing the sick and so forth. And they put the Holy Mother right in the middle of the, of the picture there. Well, Jane and I uh, fell in love with this icon and its story. And uh, so we commissioned one to be made for ourselves. And it's one of our Next prize, slide. prize icons. Next. And this is Anna Tulneva, and she is actually painting our icon. She sent us this picture afterwards. And before it was sent to us, next, next slide. slide. Anna took the icon out to the church of Coolidge in Pasca and had it blessed by the priest there. So you see Father Victor, or not Father Victor, his son, Father Georgi, holding the icon, which was sent to us. And you can't see it very well, but in the frame on the right, is the uh, same icon, which is the original venerated there at the, that church. Next church, next icon. Next, next slide. slide. <laughs> okay, one of our things that we did when we went on these uh, tours, uh, the pilgrimages, was to uh, give out vegetable seeds. Uh, these were all donated by Ed Hume and he was able to donate them because at the end of every vegetable growing season, they take down all the unsold seeds from the various retail outlets and put them in big bins in their warehouse. And they're free for anyone who will take them out of the country. And so here we are, when we brought them to Russia, they were all in uh, separate bags. Here was a bag of uh, string beans, and here was a bag of carrots, and here was a bag of turnips, and so forth. So we wanted to give these away to all the parish partners that we had there, and also to a monastery, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But we didn't want one church to get all, all of one kind and another church to get all of another kind. 
So we had to divide them up and put, put them into uh, variety packs, so to speak. You, you see us doing it there. Next slide. Uh, this is one of our American friends, uh, Ib Rawson, who went with us on the trip. And uh, he loved to give away seeds. He, he would, uh, no matter who he met, uh, whether the people spoke English or not, well, he would ask them if they loved gardening and, and he would uh, give them a packet of seeds and he would explain all about it. And nine times out of 10, the person he was talking to didn't speak any English, but that didn't stop him from explaining anyway. He was a great asset to our delegation. Next slide. Uh, one of our main goals was to uh, meet and talk to Russians and make friends. Well, here's a, an American on the left, a Russian on the right. Uh, we didn't have to work at making friends because we, we were invited to lunch at their this church. And uh, these two guys met and it didn't take them long to figure out that they'd both served on submarines. Of course, Bill Anderson on the, in the Americans submarines and, and uh, Volodya on the right on the Russian submarines. And it was just instant friendship. It was very rewarding to see these two old warriors making friends. Next slide. And here's a couple, uh, Sandy McLeod, who was a uh, parishioner with us on our delegation from St. Mark's Cathedral, visiting one of the Russian ladies at another church. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we referred to these trips as pilgrimages. And you know, pilgrimages, uh, kind of broadly defined as any trip that has a religious goal, a, a religious purpose behind it can be called a pilgrimage. So in that broad definition, probably all of you have been on pilgrimages yourself. Next slide. One of the favorite places for us to visit was a monastery called the Konyevitz Monastery because it was on Konyevitz Island in on Lake Ladoga, which is located about, uh, oh, maybe a hundred miles northeast of St. Petersburg. And this was founded in the 12th century by a father, Arseni, a monk who was from uh, a monastery at the north end of Lake Ladoga. And they realized that the people of the south end were pagans, they needed to learn about Christianity. So Father Arseni set out in a, in a small boat with the icon of the mother of God uh, in the bow of the boat. And he figured that that icon would, would guide him to where he should establish his monastery and set up his base of operations. So the, the boat came ashore at this island and they built this monastery and it's been here. Next slide. Ever since. During, uh, oh, there's the Konyevitz Mother of God, which uh, uh, is of course a copy of, of the one that Father Arseni had in the bow of his boat. Next slide. Uh, we made three trips to the monastery and uh, one of them was a cold day in April. You can see how cold we looked. And we were on a, a, a ship called a cutter. Uh, it was really a icebreaker because we had to break through about six inches of ice to get out to the island. And this cutter 
the engines would overheat. And so they plow into the ice and go about 50 yards and then the engines would overheat and we'd have to stop, let the engines cool off, which didn't take too long at that, at those cold temperatures. And the cutter would back up, take another run at it. We'd go about another 50 yards and stop, let the engines cool off again. So what was a uh, half a day trip, uh, usually, usually only took a half hour or so to, to get from the shore up to the monastery on the island. Next slide. Uh, this uh, in the background is the main church at the monastery. This uh, monastery had been a naval base after the communists had, had taken control of all the churches and church property after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, 1918. And uh, so anyway, uh, there, on our first visit there, there were still a few sailors around, but after that, well, uh, things kept getting better on every visit. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, in the middle is Father Nazari, who was in charge of the monastery there. To the right, you see Jane and I. And on the left, some students. I think there's one American and two Russians there. It was a mixed group of Russian and American high school kids that we took on that trip up to Konyevitz. Next slide. Uh, this monastery being so far from civilization, uh, they had to be somewhat self-reliant when it came to food. And here you can see their, the monastery chickens, and they also had a, a cow or two, and they also had a vegetable garden. They were very grateful to us for all the vegetable seeds that we gave them. Having cows, they had to have hay harvest, so they called for volunteers. They had a lot of volunteers from Finland because this whole thing is not very far from Finland. Next slide. Well, uh, then the last big adventures that Jane and I had together was in, uh, 2005, when we decided to take the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way to across Russia to Vladivostok. And most of you know that covers 11 time zones. Uh, a Russian travel agency arranged our trip so that we would uh, travel for a ways and then stop in a major city for overnight. And at every place we stopped, well, there was a, a local guide with a, uh, with a car waiting for us. And uh, they showed us around the, the city, all the major sites, and got us back to the train station the next morning. Next slide. Next, yeah. Uh, this is a view inside of our compartment. You can see the uh, on the table there, there's the typical Russian drinking cups. They're metal frames that the glasses sit down in and they uh, use, use the glasses to drink tea from. On every train car, there's a, uh, a hot water boiler that uh, you can get hot water for tea all hours of the day and night. Now the, uh, the drapes you see behind us cover up the picture window. And just a minute, we'll show you the typical scene out the window. Next slide. There's a, a scene of rural Russian countryside. 
some places along the Trent side that it was just <clears throat> barren country, barren tundra, they call it. But uh, mostly in the western part of Russia, well, the villages with their houses spread out like this, they all had their own gardens and fences and animals. Next slide. Interesting. Um, this city that we visited was Ekaterinburg, and this church is built on the site where there was a house where the Tsar and his family were imprisoned for a while in 1918 before they were led down to the basement and assassinated. And so uh, years later, they, they built a church on the site of this terrible tragedy. Next slide. Uh, the next major city we came to was Novosibirsk and it was raining that day and so uh, most of what we saw of Novosibirsk was through a car window but we did visit this museum of birch bark handicrafts and we were very impressed with all the things that they made uh, hairpins and belt buckles and canisters. And next slide, we'll show you some canisters. Uh, there's food canisters made of birch bark that we bought there in Novosibirsk. Next there. slide. Uh, the next city was Irkutsk and uh, you see here a monument to Admiral uh, Kolchak, who, even though he was an admiral, he <clears throat> was uh, the last leader of the White Army. And you can see the, the uh, two figures on the pedestal. That's a Red Army soldier and a White Army soldier, and they're making friends. Uh, Alexander Kolchak. Uh, was killed there in Irkutsk and was led out onto the ice where a hole had been chopped and he was shot and his body was let fall into the river and it floated down through a series of rivers, disappeared. I've often wondered about his overcoat. If uh, if they took his overcoat off first, it would have, it would have been a shame to lose that overcoat. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, we took about a two hour drive from Irkutsk up, up to Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is uh, the largest body of fresh water in the world. It's uh, about 450 miles long and some 50 miles wide and uh, very deep. And we stayed at a, a bed and breakfast there and they arranged for us to meet Alexei, you see in the picture here, and Alexei took us on a, a boat ride around the lake. Next, Next slide. Um, at the outlet of the lake, there's this rock. It's called Shaman Rock because in ancient times before the coming of Christianity, well, this was where they conducted trials, trial by ordeal. And they'd take the accused person, the defendant out and put them on that rock. And if they were still there the next morning, well, it proved their innocence and they were released. And if they were gone the next morning, by action of waves and wind, then it proved they were guilty and uh, life went on. Next but slide. The next, next slide. Uh, here we are climbing, climbing up on the rock. Alexei didn't want us to do it because he said it was dangerous, but we had to do it. Next slide. Oh, uh, on our uh, boat ride, we uh, went up the south end of the lake and at one time there was a railway 
running along the shore there. But the, uh, the communists built a dam and flooded parts of the railway, which uh, made it inoperable. They had to build a new railroad because they built the dam. So next slide. Alexei left us off. We hiked up the uh, side of the lake and came to this tunnel, which was one time the trains went through, uh, tunnel to nowhere. There's a number of these tunnels along the south end of the lake there. Next slide. Uh, the lady in the middle was our host at the bed and breakfast, her husband on the left and her mother on the right. Very good stay there. I remember part of our stay there was a, was a terrific thunderstorm. And uh, I was sitting on my uh, bed and I happened to look down at the uh, electrical outlet just at the time that a bolt of lightning struck and there was a light, lightning or something carried out, flashed out of the electrical outlet about six inches. Well, anyway, we survived that. But one other good thing about the uh, stay there was they had a uh, sauna. So we were able to take a nice Russian sauna. Next slide. The next <laughs> city we came to was called Ulan Ude. And it was interesting about uh, Lake Baikal on the west bank there mostly Christians and on the right bank where this is, they were mostly Buddhists. This uh, statue of uh, Lenin is visited. He's still regarded as a hero by people, no matter whether they've overthrown communism or not. But uh, not only do school groups like you see here visit the statue, but uh, when a young couple gets married, uh, the bride and groom come from the ceremony out to the statue to have their picture taken. Next slide. The guide there who was uh, of the local Buddhist population uh, took us out to a Buddhist monastery. This monastery is somewhat connected with the with the uh, main Buddhist monks clear down in Tibet. But uh, <laughs> anyway, she's telling, telling us here about uh, Buddhist customs and, and the monastery and so forth. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, this uh, Siberian tiger has nothing to do with their, their religion, it's just uh, something guarding the temple entrance. Next slide. Uh, we, we learned about prayer wheels there. These are large cylindrical wheels, which uh, have prayers engraved on them. And you go up to them and give them a spin and that sends the prayers off into the into the atmosphere and so you're actually every time you spin the wheel you're, you're sending prayer to God. Next slide. And another way of worshiping you see here uh, like clothes on a clothesline uh, these are prayer flags each one of those pieces of cloth is has uh, a prayer written on it and so when the when the wind blows, the, the prayers are again sent to sent to God. Next slide. We went to a Mongolian restaurant, and this uh, you can tell by the color scheme that they uh, they like the same bright colors that we saw there in the monastery. The food was uh, not spectacular, but uh, the scenery was. Next slide. Uh, the, the train we got on at uh, Ulan Ude was called the Rasia. And it was very much like the other trains we'd ridden on, but uh, 
to had a different name. And this was the train we got on. We were on for almost two days to get over to Vladivostok. Next slide. We made a lot of friends on the train. And here, here's a couple of them. There's a, the, the grandson and grandfather. And the grandfather wanted to show his grandson Russia. So they uh, have taken a trip on the trans side. And we're going all the way to Vladivostok with, on the Russia without stopping, without getting off like Jane and I had done. And, uh, they were visiting some relatives there in Vladivostok, and they were then they were getting back on the train and going all the way back to Moscow. Next slide. Next slide. And here we are at the end of the line. We've traveled 9,288 kilometers from Moscow, crossed 11 time zones. And it's interesting that uh, in Russia, the, in Russia, the train schedules are all printed with Moscow time. So no matter which time zone you're in, if you're on a train, you're traveling by Moscow time. So it was a very, very interesting trip and uh, I recommend it highly. I'm wondering uh, uh, towards the, this is, towards the end of my talk, uh, if we have any questions or comments from some of you folks listening. Can I do the screen sharing? Do you want me to stop um, sharing the screen so we yeah. can see each yeah. other? Yeah. So we can see people. And I'll put it on gallery view so we can all see each other. And if, you're, if you want to talk, you'll um, need to unmute yourself, which you can do by clicking the little microphone in the lower left or upper right if, you, if it's an Apple. Um, or you can just hold down the space bar while you're talking. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to say much about, but uh, the book that I wrote called Russian Passages is available on Amazon and has a lot of these same pictures, but this talk <clears> I just gave has about twice as many, <laughs> and these are in color. Could folks get a signed copy directly from you? Yeah, if you'd like, I'll, I'll sign a copy. All right. I, I have a few uh, left here. He's about to get some more uh, printed, but uh, kind of a little bit in between. Dick, um, I that was just fabulous. I so envy you that trip. Uh, years and years ago, I wanted to do that trip, and I but I wanted to come from the south up to to uh, Vladivostok and then take it the opposite direction because a lot of the hitchhikers and stuff that we were traveling with were doing that. But it was the time when we couldn't get through China. So anyway, uh, because we weren't allowed to go into China, but. Anyhow, I so envy you that trip, and I just thank you so much for sharing that. It was just great. You're very welcome. You know, there's the, the Transside Railroad there, you have your choice. You can go through China, which is shorter, but you have to wait for them to change wheels on the train. Or you can do like Jane and I did. You go up over the north end of, of past the north end of China, and circle around. Yeah, yeah. We, we decided to go through Russia because we would have had to get another visa uh, to get into China. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit more complicated. Right, right. But the, from uh, Ulan Ude to Vladivostok, it was actually oh, oh, three days and it was um, a lot of the same scenery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. It went, might have been more interesting going through Mongolia and, 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 and China, but uh, we made a lot of friends on the train and that was wonderful. Yeah, right. Well, I bought, I bought the book from Dick and um, I would really highly recommend it. Thank you. You're welcome. 
I understand from Alan that this uh, talk will be on YouTube later. So make the link available and we can tell our friends about it. Absolutely, we'll do that. Any other questions or comments? Well, really, I want to thank. Sorry, go ahead, Jane. I just I'm really struck by uh, these very um, tense relationships with Russia right now, and um, that not a whole lot has changed since 1950 when Dick started learning Russian, <laughs> and the same um, uh, the. The, this, the same, you know, what would you call uh, personal um, relationships are so important. And um, several of our Russian friends have said things like, we don't care what the, 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 the government, your government and our government try to do. We're still friends. Hmm. And uh, it's something to remember that um, they're, 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 they're really wonderful. Wonder, we've made wonderful friends, and it grieves us to know that we're in such very difficult times. Yes, Putin is not the typical Russian, right? Well, he's a, he's a, typical, <laughs> he's a typical KGB officer. Yes, that's, right, that's exactly. His whole life being, uh, you know, a KGB officer before he became president. So that's right. what you get. That is what you get. And some people like that that strong they say we need russia needs a strong leader and uh, they really didn't like gorbachev very much because I mean, we did because we, you know the set the west did but uh, the russians didn't because he sort of let things fall apart that's their view mm. <clears throat> What happened with Gorbachev was he, he just didn't send in the army when the, the Berlin Wall started to fall. A lot of people really criticized him for that. So some criticized him because he was too weak and others criticized him because he wasn't strong enough. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. Okay. Thank you for coming and listening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, Dick and Jane. Fun with Dick and Jane. This has been an inspiration, truly, and a way to take us somewhere when we can't really go too many places. So thanks, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Okay, yeah. you too, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.